Hi, my name is Rob Corliss. I'm going to talk today about Molnar's Law. Before I do that, I always make this announcement. This is my journal. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Maple Transactions. This is an open access journal with no page charges. And for this talk, I want to especially mention that uh, student papers are welcome. Okay, Molnar's Law. Well, first, who is Cleve Moeller? Well, first thing, he's a very nice and smart guy. Um, one of the things that he did was he co-founded the MathWorks and wrote um, MATLAB. And what is MATLAB? That's an extremely useful piece of mathematical software, which I think has tens of millions of users. And according to the internet, it's a $1.1 billion a year company. So in these slides, which I will put on my web page, there's a link to his Wikipedia page, but you can just find that. Uh, all by yourself. So, okay, well, maybe Moeller's Law is worth paying attention to. Whatever Moeller's Law is. I'm not going to tell you straight out what it is. I'm going to sneak up on it. The following question occurred on a grade 11 math contest exam. Um, if x raised to the power x raised to the power x raised to the power x and so on to infinity is equal to 2, what is x? Now, pause a minute for you to solve this when I'm giving this lecture live. Right now, I want you to pause it, pause the video, and try and solve the equation, and try not to use anything more advanced than what a senior high school student would use. I do say that these uh, example, this example and the ones that follow are gonna seem pretty pure and not very applied. Uh, and that's because I wanna work with the simplest possible examples, and they're tricky enough. Okay, you've paused this, and now that you're back, I'll tell you that Leonard Euler worked on this problem after hearing that the Marquis de Condorcet had as well. And Leonard Euler, you, cer you should certainly know, was one of the greatest mathematicians ever. Um, the Marquis de Condorcet is justifiably famous as a mathematician, but much more importantly, as one of the greatest political thinkers of the Enlightenment. And his Wikipedia page is really well worth reading. So. Some interesting people worked on this apparently simple little problem. Okay, well, here's uh, two methods of solution. The first and the simplest method, and this is the one that I actually used when I was in grade 11. If x raised to the x and so on is equal to 2, well, you look at that tower of powers, x raised to the etc., and it's exactly the same. The infinite tower is the same whether you start at the very bottom or at one short of the very bottom. So therefore, x raised to this infinite tower is the same as x squared. So x squared equals 2, and so there x, therefore x is the square root of 2, about 1.414. And we ignore the negative root. Negative root is a little bit weird um, for, for now. Second solution is really the same. Take logarithms, and now you say, ah, that power x raised to the x, x, x that, that infinite power comes down by the power rule for logs. Log of a to the b is b times log of a, as long as everything is positive. Now, one tricky part about that, is, and one common error, is people might just take down 1x, and that's wrong. You really have to take, on, to take down the entire power. And if you do that, then you say, oh, now it's easier to recognize that x to the x is equal to 2. So you get 2 log x. And so 2 log x has to be log 2, because you took the log of both sides. And so you get log x is 1 half log 2, which is the log of square root of 2, so x is root 2 again. So the two different methods give us the same solution, which is great. Really happy with that. Let's do it again. That was so much fun. Now let's solve a different problem. x to the x, etc. is equal to 4. What is x? Okay, I'll let you solve it. Pause the video and go off and solve the problem. Now we know how to do it, so it should be easy. Great, now that you're back. You solve the same, the same way. We get x to the power of 4 is equal to 4. And that gives us x is the fourth root of 4, which is the fourth root of 2 squared, which is 2 to the power of 2 over 4, which is 2 to the 1 half, which is root 2. Wait. OK, try it with logarithms. We do that with logarithms. All the powers come down and replace that with 4. Get 4 log x is log 4, or x is root 2 again. So that means that 2 is equal to root 2 to the root 2 to the root 2, etc., which is equal to 4. 
did we really just prove that 2 equals 4? Something went very bizarre there. Now, in order to fix this, we have to be more careful. I mean, one way to do it is to replace that infinite tower with a sequence. So we put a0 equal to 0, and we define an plus 1 as x raised to the power an. And it's important to do it in that order. Then we can answer questions about that infinite tower by answering questions about what happens to this infinite sequence. Now at last, we come to Mohler's Law. Mohler's Law is the hardest thing to compute. It's something that doesn't exist. And when we analyze that sequence, and we look really hard at that sequence, we find that there is an x, namely x equals root 2, such that the infinite tower is equal to 2. But there is no such x, which will make the limit 4, unless we start at a different a0. Can't start at a0 equals 0. And I'm not going to prove that here. It's hard to prove a negative. Mohler's law, Mohler's law applies here. The, hard thing, the hardest thing to compute is something that doesn't exist, even if you've computed an answer. The answer is wrong, and not only that, paradoxical. So related is Perron's paradox. Perron's paradox said, let n be the largest positive integer. Suppose that n was bigger than 1. Then multiply both sides by n, you get n squared is bigger than n, which is a contradiction. Therefore, n equals 1. So we've computed an answer, and it's wrong. So the moral of Mohler's law is even if you have computed an answer, you have to be careful. And it's also related to the philosophical notion of begging the question. And that is uh, assuming what you want to be true in the first place. All right, let's move away from this funny little tricky sequence and, and consider integrals. You, you've just been studying integrals if you're taking a course in calculus. And let's look at this particular integral, integral from x equals 0 to infinity of 1 over x to the power 4 plus e to the x. And this integral isn't too much stranger than the ones you've seen already. Maybe something like this could occur in practice. Uh, I've certainly seen uh, integrals that look like this that occur in practice. Now, one of my favorite references for integration is a, a paper which is online uh, by Velma Kahan. Uh, he wrote it in 1980, it appeared in the Hewlett-Packard Journal, Handheld Calculator Evaluates Integrals, and I really recommend that you have a look at that paper. So we're going to consider that first integral, equation 8, and we're also going to consider another example, an integral from x equals 0 to pi over 4 of x times tan x with respect to x. And that last one looks as though it might occur on an exam. In fact, I did put that on an exam once. It was a, uh, a little unsettling for the students, and you'll see why. Both of those integrals exist, but I claim that for the first one, there is no short expression in terms of known functions. And that, you know, I say there's no such thing as a short expression in terms of no functions. You might think, well, how do you prove that? And while the second one can be expressed only in terms of something that you likely haven't heard of before, so this definite integral from 0 to pi over 4 of x tan x is minus pi log 2 over 8 plus Catalan over 2. Where Catalan here stands for Catalan's constant, named after Eugène Charles Catalan, who was a French-Belgian mathematician. And it's about 0.915. As you see there, we can compute as many digits as we like. Now, the indefinite integral, integral from x equals 0 up to some indefinite limit, if you want to compute a primitive for x tan x, or an antiderivative for x tan x, some people just call it a, a, an integral, um, the only way you can do that is if you allow expressions that contain dilogarithms or their equivalent. And I'm sure that you haven't heard of a dilogarithm. It's not part of the elementary calculus course. So that's kind of strange. In the first one, first integral, I say that you can't write any short expression in terms of known functions. And here I say, yeah, you can write one, but only if we have a, a new function called the dilogarithm. Go back to Kahan's paper. He said, students are taught integration as a process that starts with little f and ends with big F. But that process hardly ever succeeds. A compact uh, big F of u is almost always difficult or impossible 
to construct from a given little f of u. Uh, that is a strong statement, difficult or impossible to construct. Uh, you can make a start on the algebraic theory of this, which uh, started with Liouville and leads to what's now known as the Risch integration algorithm by trying to prove for yourself that the simple integral of 1 over u with respect to u cannot be expressed as a polynomial in x or as a ratio of polynomials in x. That's within reach. You, you, you can be expected to try and puzzle out the fact that you can't do this in terms of polynomials or as ratios of polynomials. It's tricky. It's not simple to do this, but it's within reach to do that. And they, But that gives the key idea is you've got this finite alf alphabet of things that you're going to express the answer in, just polynomials or, or ratios of polynomials, and you show that no matter what you do in that alphabet, none of those things, when you differentiate, you get 1 over u, so, or 1 over x. But both of these integrals exist perfectly well in the numerical sense, in the sense of being the area under a curve. And so is the natural logarithm, the integral of 1 over u. What doesn't exist in this case is merely an expression in terms of simpler functions. So similarly to express the integral of log u over 1 plus u, one needs this new function, in this case the dilogarithm. If I use maple to do this, maple says it instantly, it says, oh, that integral is pi squared over 12 plus dilog of 1 plus x plus log x times log of x plus 1. So by extending the alphabet, we can do uh, this one, and in fact, we can also do the x tan x one as well by a change of variable. Maple gives the, the answer perfectly well. Some integrals really don't exist, not even numerically. So there's no compact finite expression for this following one. There's no finite value either. You integrate not from x from u equals 1, but integrate from u equals 0 of 1 over u. So we're dividing by 0 at the left endpoint. This is what's known as a, uh, an improper integral. And in this particular case, uh, you can't do it. There's, it that, uh, that answer is going to be infinity. Well, let's go back to that first integral, 1 over x to the power 4 plus e to the x. And we were integrating from x equals 0 all the way up to infinity. But let's just chop it off. We'll just chop it off at uh, 3. We'll integrate from 0 to 3. Never mind the integral from 3 to infinity. We'll worry about that later. If we look at this curve, you see that it's got a perfectly decent area underneath it. So we ought to be able to find the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx. And we can, but we must use numerical quadrature. And one nice thing about numerical quadrature is, that you, it quadrature is you can give real assurance that you really got the right answer and there's no fooling around. Because for this example, the function is monotonically decreasing, it goes down at the left, and, uh, and as x goes uh, increasing, the function f continues to decrease, then the left-hand Riemann sum provides an upper bound on the area, while the right-hand Riemann sum provides a lower bound. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And using 1,000 terms in uh, these Riemann sums, of course I get a machine to do that, I'm not going to add up 1,000 terms by myself, you can see that 0 0.7407 is smaller than this integral from 0 to 3 of this function, which is smaller than 0 0.7437. So we've got uh, two digits of the answer with uh, just getting the computer to do a little bit of work. More sophisticated schemes will give tighter bounds, and we'll see some in a moment. More computer work will give more precision and certainty. Now about that monotonically decreasing thing, that's the kind of thing that students are routinely uh, asked to at least observe. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. So here is the left-hand Riemann sum for this function done in Maple in the student calculus one uh, Riemann sum package. And it says, it does a picture of it, and you can see that the Riemann sum with 10 partitions here gives us an upper bound on the area because the, the function is decreasing and in every case, when we attach the, the height of the rectangle to the left-hand point, that gives us an upper bound. So the sum of all of these little rectangles, their area must be larger than the true area. And this says, with 10 points, it's 0.898, so that's a larger estimate. And here's the, the right-hand Riemann sum. We attach this on the right-hand uh, point to the curve, and you see we give it a lower bound. 
because the function is decreasing. And with 10 terms, we get 0.6. So 0.6 is smaller than the true area, which is smaller than 0.8. With only 10 points, 10 intervals, that's not enough for us to give uh, accuracy that we're particularly happy with. But I said that when you did that with 1,000 points, uh, not 10, you got a good answer. Well, let's go back to that simple little integral of 1 over x. And if we're integrating from 0 to 1, say, then we take uh, equally spaced points, uh, 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, and so on, up to n over n. Um, now we do the right-hand Riemann sum with those points, then the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over u, with respect to u, has got to be bigger than the width of each of those intervals times 1 over k over n. And you work all that out, and you get the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1 over k. And you may have already seen a proof that the sum on the right goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So that actually proves that the area under the curve 1 over, one over u on the interval 0 to 1 is infinity. There are other methods for integrating things numerically. You don't just have to use the left or the right hand Riemann sum. One of the most famous ones is called the trapezoidal rule. And it's so useful that some people keep reinventing it. So for example, a researcher named Tai reinvented the trapezoidal rule and published a paper in 1994 and called the rule Tai's model after her parents. The paper was published in the journal Diabetes Care. And one of the referees had already noted that this was not new, but the paper was published and it has been cited many, many times. And then there are lots of things, lots of lessons you can draw from this, but the one that I think is the most important is that diabetes care needs numerical integration. And that might be surprising to people, but in fact it does. Um, another fact which is maybe not that surprising is that Thai's teachers did not teach her the trapezoidal rule. And unfortunately, many teachers do not teach numerical methods, and I think that that is a... a something that needs to be remedied. Trapezoidal rule, just instead of doing rectangles, uses trapezoids. It attaches things on both ends, and um, so you get a trapezoid. And in this case, you can hardly see the trapezoids diff being different from the curve. Uh, but what's important about something that's convex up is if the curve is convex up, then the trapezoid will go above it. So the trapezoidal rule will give an overestimate of the integral. And if instead we use the midpoint rule, which is to take a rectangle at the middle of the interval instead of at either left or the right end, if something is convex up, then you can see by rotating that line about that its midpoint, you just kind of rotate it um, so that it's, so if you're a mirror, I you rotate it so that it, that it touches, is tangent to the curve, you see that the rotation doesn't change the area because the one part of it goes up and the other part goes down the same amount. You get congruent triangles of different areas there. So you get that the um, area under the midpoint rule is a lower bound on there. So here we have 0.738 is smaller than the, the value of the integral. And the upper bound from the trapezoidal rule, whoops, upper bound for the trapezoidal rule was 0.749. So with just 10 intervals, we've already got nearly two places with the trapezoidal rule and the midpoint rule. So this statement just shows, just this slide just says just what I um, said in words. And so we get uh, 0.72 less than the integral is less than 0.75 with just 10 sub intervals. If we used 1,000 intervals as with the Riemann sum before, then we get 0.74225 is less than the integral is less than 0.742256. And so we can write that the value of the integral is 0.742255 and then 61 above and 49 below, which means the true answer is trapped between those two numbers. And this can always be done for smooth functions. So numerical methods can give you a proof of existence if you do it carefully. But what about the tail? We've been Cutting, cutting things off at, at 3 instead of going out to infinity. Well, uh, the integral of the tail is less than the integral of 1 over e to the x because x to the power of 4 
is bigger than bigger than one there. So you add one to e to the x, or add something that's bigger than one to e to the x, you get something that's bigger than e to the x, and you divide by something that's bigger than e to the x, then you, what you get is something that's smaller. So in that integral on the right there, that bounding one, is one we can do. Um, and that is the integral of e to the minus x from x equals 3 to infinity. We can do that one analytically, and we get uh, that that's e to the minus 3. And it's about 0.049. So for the integral from 0 to infinity, our integral from 0 to 3 isn't going to give us as much accuracy as we want. So if we really want the integral up to infinity, then say, okay, let's work uh, on the integral over 0 to 10. And then the error in chopping the tail will be smaller than e to the minus 10, which is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6. And that might be enough for your particular application. And if it's not, then use chop it farther away or take more ter uh, more terms in the trapezoidal or midpoint rule. So let's just look back a little bit at that. Um, I think it's important to say that students should get training in the technology that they can and will use in their working lives. And I maintain that it's not easy to learn how to use these the technology um, uh, subroutines and machines or whatever on your own. The technology is always changing, so I used Maple for the examples in this talk, but lots of other systems work as well. The mathematics is changing too, but less rapidly. For example, the trapezoidal rule is maybe 2,000 years old. Certainly Archimedes would have understood it. But finally, understanding how to use the technology responsibly requires understanding the mathematics. You can't just push buttons and hope that you get the answer. You actually have to know what's going on. So let's talk about some harder examples. Let's uh, uh, consider the following differential equations. So first, y prime equals x squared plus y squared with additional condition y of 0 equals 1. And another one from a beautiful book by Hubbard and West called Differential Equations on Dynamical Systems Point of View. dx by dt, which we write as x dot, as Newton did. x dot is equal to x squared minus t squared. Now the initial condition is x of 0 is minus a half. Finally, y prime equals minus the square root of y. This is Torricelli's law for emptying a bucket with the initial condition y of 0 equals 1. And uh, Julia Jankowski and I wrote a paper about this, which we published in Siam Review in the education section, called Variations on a Theme of Euler. So all of these are simple first-order differential, scalar differential equations, really, really simple examples. Um, the first one doesn't have any particular modeling in mind. The last one, though, as I said, does model the, the fluid emptying out of a leaky bucket. But I should say a couple of words about differential equations in general. So differential equations and their generalizations provide one of the main tools for understanding how systems evolve. Uh, you will for sure have seen the growth equation, y prime of t is proportional to y of t. So this is used in uh, radioactive decay and population growth, and uh, it certainly uh, models initial growth of, of a lot of populations. The logistic equation is similar, and not only do we have this k times y of t term, but we've also got minus l times y squared of t. So that says that the growth of a population is proportional to the population itself. The more people you have, the more people you have giving birth. But then when you have y, a minus y squared term in there that says the more interactions with the people that they have, then there maybe is more competition for food or something like that, um, that tends to uh, detract from the population growth. And this particular simple model fits some bacteria more than it does large organization, uh, organisms, um, but it gives a limiting population. In, in there. So that's, that's a simple one. And then I have a link here to the Black-Scholes uh, differential equation. Now that's not just an a ordinary differential equation, it's a, it involves partial derivatives. And this is kind of funny because uh, its solutions determine prices for certain assets. And if people agree that those prices uh, produced by solution of the Black-Scholes equations then somehow you have the, the Black-Scholes equation determining the reality and not just being a model of what's going on. 
Uh, there are infinitely many more differential equations. It have many engineering applications, uh, um, economic modeling applications, uh, everything basically. The examples that I showed before are among the simplest possible differential equations. Some equations can be solved exactly in symbols, just as integrals can, but most must be solved numerically. Um, just one of those, consider just one of those examples. Let's say for y prime equals x squared plus y squared. That's the first one that I have. So consider the two related equations. u prime is 0 squared plus u squared. So I replace the x squared with a, a 0 squared. And v prime is 1 squared plus v squared. So I replace the x squared by 1 squared. So I'm thinking about these equations, all three of these equations, on the interval 0 to 1. And if we start them all off in the same value, u of 0 is y of 0 is v of 0 is 1, then on the interval 0 less than x less than or equal to 1, we can deduce that the slope u prime is going to be less than the slope y prime, which is going to be less than the slope v prime. So that means that the growth of u is going to be this, and the growth of y is going to be a bit more, and the growth of uh, v is going to be a bit more. So we can deduce that u of x itself is less than y, as that's going to be less than v on the interval. So now, can we solve these equations 20 and 21? Can we solve u prime equals u squared? Can we solve v prime equals v squared? Both of these are simpler than the original equation. If we divide the first equation by u squared, we get u prime of x over u squared is equal to 1. And we divide the second equation by 1 plus v squared, we get v prime over 1 plus v squared is equal to 1. And now we integrate both sides with respect to x. We integrate from x equals 0 to t, say. It could be any symbol, I don't care what. So we integrate from x equals 0 to t of u prime over u squared with respect to x. Now well, let's leave that for the moment. But on the right-hand side, we're integrating x equals 0 to t of 1. Well, I can integrate 1. You integrate 1, you get x. And so x at the upper limit is t, and x at the lower limit is 0. So you get t minus 0, which is t. So on the right-hand side, we get t. And on the second equation, the right-hand side's the same. So again, we get that t. So now we've got these two integrals to do u prime over u squared and v prime over 1 plus v squared. In both cases, change of variable does it for us. So integral of u prime over u squared dx, if you change the variable and say let w equals u, then dw is going to be u prime dx. And so you're going to get integral of 1 over w squared. And you integrate that, you get minus 1 over w. And I had just introduced that variable w for uh, talking about purposes. So the integral of that is minus 1 over x between uh, x equals 0 and x equals t. When x equals t, that at the top, that's minus 1 over u of t. And when x equals 0, that's going to be u of 0, which we said was 1. So that integral becomes 1 minus 1 over u of t is equal to t. And we solve that for, for u of t. We get u of t is 1 over 1 minus t. The second one, we had v prime over 1 plus v squared. So we put in w equals v, and you get dw is v prime dx divided by 1 plus w squared. And the integral of 1 over uh, 1 plus w squared is arctan of w. So we get arctan of v of x between t and x equals 0. So we get arctan of v of t minus arctan of 1 is t. Or arctan of v of t is t plus pi over 4, because arctan of 1 is pi over 4. Or v of t is tangent of t plus pi over 4. Now, here's the fun bit. Both of those functions are singular on 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. The v function is singular at t equals pi over 4, because that gives us pi over 4 plus pi over 4 is pi over 2. And tangent of pi over 2 is infinity. So v certainly goes off singular, but so does u. u goes off to infinity when t equals 1. And y is trapped between those two. y is trapped between u and v, so it must be singular. Great. Well, what happens if we solve this equation numerically, naively? We use a method called Euler's method, one of the simplest possible methods. Uh, we solve that numerically, and here's this numerical solution with h equals 
0.1, bup, 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 bup. and maybe it's 0 0.05, and this says the solution at y equals 1 is just a bit bigger than 12. So the numerical solution, it looks plausible, looks fine, but it's wrong. Cannot be right, because the true solution of that differential equation is infinite, somewhere between 0 and 1, actually somewhere between pi over 4 and, and 1. And Moeller's law applies to this. The hardest thing to compute is something that doesn't exist. So we've computed something, but it's not correct. Why do I tell you these things? I tell you these things because when you are out in the real world, you will use power tools. You need to be trained in the use of the tools. You will encounter problems more difficult than these examples. You need to know when to trust the output of your computer and when not to. So you, I call that discipline computational epistemology. One of the difficulties is some of the, your future tools have not been invented yet. And so in order to deal with that, you have to develop useful habits of thinking. Existence and uniqueness of solutions is worth money. I have a colleague who made a nice consulting fee for an engineering firm by telling them that the discovering for them and then telling them that the linear system of equations that they were trying to solve did not have a solution. And so he made some money on that. And they avoided having a structure fall down and avoided a lawsuit uh, because of that. And sometimes it's worth more than money because sometimes the devices that you're building or the policies that you're building will affect people's lives and you can cost them more than money. You can cost their life than itself. Here's a useful principle. A good numerical method gives you the exact solution of a nearby problem. So the paper I discussed previously, uh, Variations on a Theme of Euler, uh, discusses a particular way that you can do this when you solve differential equations numerically. One way you can do it is to substitute your solution back into the original equation and see what is left, out, what is left over. Suppose your computed solution is capital Y of X. The true solution might be little y of X, which you don't know. So then we compute R of X, which is the derivative of your computed solution, minus X squared minus Y squared. And that means you want to be able to differentiate numerical solutions. So that means you want to interpolate them. There's some things called automatic differentiation, which are a very practical thing to learn about. Anyway, once you've got this, the R of X is called the residual. This is different from the financial residuals, but anyway, it's the residuals, what's left over when you substitute your solution back into the equation. If your residual is zero, then good, you've found the solution to the equation. But normally, it'll usually be small and not zero, and you have to interpret. And I tell you another hard problem here, detecting zero is actually provably impossible in some contexts, and I'll tell you about that at length if you like. But if it's just small, then you say, oh, um, we've actually solved exactly the equation that I wanted to solve, y prime of x is equal to x squared plus y squared, plus a small residual term. And we've got the exact solution to that. And now you can go back and say, does this equation model your original problem well, if r of x is small? And maybe, you know, this is just fine. Um, then you have to think, well, what is the effect of this change? What is the effect of this perturbation of the equation? Because there are some physical perturbations of the model as well. Your model equations are never going to be exactly right. And some problems are sensitive to changes. And we say ill-conditioned. Um, some disciplines use the word unstable to say that some things are not sensitive to, to changes. Uh, but I prefer the term ill-conditioned. Ill-conditioned 200 years ago meant a person. A person could be ill-conditioned. And what that was was they were rude. They didn't have good manners. And you can, so you can say, if your equation is rude and doesn't have good manners, then, it, then a, a small change in it will change the answer quite a lot. Now, answering these questions, does this equation model your original problem well? Or is it sensitive to changes? Sometimes those are hard, but you need to do those anyway. You need to say at some point, is my model a good model of the situation? And is my model sensitive to some of the things that I'm ignoring? So they're the right questions to ask in practice.
So by using that tool, you're not adding to the amount of work that you have to do. You're just using normal common sense. And to end, I'll end with another announcement. This is a, a new book by uh, Neil Kalkin, Eunice Chan, and myself, and it should be available this month. I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the first copies of it. Um, this is meant for uh, people between high school and first year university, but there's, there's some advanced stuff in there too. And the purpose of the book was to help people to learn Python. Uh, and we use some interesting mathematics in order to do so. And there are open questions in it if you want to come and, and, and play, but it's meant to be accessible. And it's online as well, it's online freely. If you just Google computational discovery on Jupiter, you will get to see the book as it is. But if you want to buy a physical copy, physical copy will be available from Siam very shortly. Thank you for listening.